Welcome to the Free Birth Podcast, a supportive space for people who are learning, exploring, and celebrating their autonomous choices in childbirth. Together, we'll unpack truths, share personal stories, and claim our ability to birth freely and intuitively. Here's your host, Emily Saldea. So, Emily. Yes, Katya. Our mother love and retreat is happening. Are you excited? Oh, beyond excited. The countdown is on February 3rd through 10th, 2020, baby. I also love that it's a full moon. And I love where we'll be. It's the most epic 15 cabana eco lodge overlooking the ocean, right here in beautiful Dominican Republic. Mm, tell me there's an infinity pool. Yep. And amazing food. What about endless tropical fruit and beach time? Oh, yes. And don't forget that while we're there, humpback whales come to birth their babies in Samana Bay, right where we'll be. Oh, my gosh. What should we do the rest of the time? How about nourishing yoga and transformational workshops and dancing, drumming, connecting with Mama Earth? Oh, so good. And the group of women who've already signed up are incredible. So what else? A bunch of surprises and gifts. Like what? Like a yummy massage for every woman. Okay, what else? I'm not telling. Everyone loves surprises. Mother loving. Without the G. Retreat.com. Today I sit down with Christy from Australia, who surprised me with her courage and strength. She secretly planned a free birth with her first child, only letting her partner in on her plans. And after a perfect and euphoric free birth in her home, Christy was unfortunately whisked away to the hospital when her mother called 911. But Christy not only birthed her daughter that day, she birthed herself into a fierce and powerful woman, a mother with a voice, and thankfully, she learned how to use it. So it was probably over three and a half years ago now, and I met my partner, and yeah, I believe in conscious conception, like we made a baby pretty quickly. And before that, I had never planned to have kids. Like I saw unhappy parents and unhappy kids and I didn't want that. And the only birth stories that I had heard was mine and my sister's from my mum. And we both ended up in C-sections. Wow. Yeah. And I knew that I didn't want that. So when I fell pregnant, I just felt so unprepared. Like, yeah, I didn't know what to do. I'd never thought about it before. So it kind of came to a shock to me, even though we had planned it. Yeah, I didn't know what else to do, so I just went to the doctor. Totally. And um, <clears throat> so then they put me into the system, into the hospital, and I just went straight into appointments. And I knew that's where I didn't want to be, but I wasn't sure what else to do at the time. So mm-hmm. I started looking into home births in my hometown and with private midwives and there was nothing in my area the only there was one private midwife and she could only come to the hospital with me but through my appointments I had different midwives every time like I would say natural birth and I just felt like that was taken as a joke like then they'd just say oh yeah we do that but also like you probably need all of these other things that I didn't believe in Mm -hmm. So, but I did look on her Facebook page, this private midwife, and 
straight away she pushed things that I didn't believe in. And I think it's a blessing in disguise now, but I just wrote her off completely from there. So I kept going to my appointments at the hospital and yeah, I just felt like I was on a conveyor belt through a factory, like just, yeah, it, I like didn't like being at the hospital. I felt nervous and anxious the whole time. Like my whole pregnancy, I was, had morning sickness up until 30 weeks. So it, was, oh. <laughs> it was really oh. hard. And it was, hard for me to go to those appointments and then I would come home and build myself back up again because I had like a really good pregnancy besides the morning sickness and they still made me worry the whole time like they were trying to find things wrong with me and my baby and there wasn't Mm -hmm. but I still felt so stressed but also my mum works at the hospital in admin and so I felt like there was no way for me to get out of going to the appointments without causing like a lot of extra worry. So, but I would like sit in my car before the appointment and just think, imagine if I could just be pregnant, like Mm -hmm. that's it, like just be pregnant. And like, it's at the time it felt so like that wasn't possible, but it totally oh, was. <laughs> so sad. I know. I can't but, wait for next time. Like it's going to be so different. Yeah. I mean, you, you found your way, you know, and, and it really speaks to the truth or the, what is the right word? Like the fierceness and the intuition that women hold about birth, because like you started off saying, you really didn't know much about it. You knew your own birth stories, which were surgical for whatever reasons. And yet there was this thing in you that was like, no, even though literally your entire sphere is saying yes. I mean, it just, it never ceases to amaze me how authentic because duh, we're mammals and, you know, birthing (laughs) is actually shocker, normal and natural. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it is our animal nature to align with what you eventually do, but it just never, it never doesn't amaze me how even in deep in the system, like everything you just described, there still is that voice that's like, no, there's something else. Yeah. I still, I just had this, like, even though yeah, I never, <clears throat> excuse me, I never ended up voicing my, like, intention for my birth. And I kind of just, kind of just agreed with everyone around me and pretended, like, because I didn't want to cause any confrontation. Mm. But deep down, I was like, I'm the only one that is, can do what's right for my baby. Like, no one loves my baby more than I do. Mm-hmm. So I just had this, like, really strong like I had to protect her so I would go home because I couldn't work because I was really sick so every day I was just researching and so if I was told like this intervention is necessary I would go home and read why it wasn't necessary and it was so confronting to me like I started it started to get me down like I would also hear stories, my friends that had had babies and they're like, they didn't think their stories were horrible, like from the hospital. But to me, they sounded like that's not what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And it was hard for me to hear. So I would always, yeah, research why, if that was necessary or not. And then I'd find out like, I'm not doing that. And I'd tell my partner and yeah, he just agreed with everything I said. And this eventually, I think the last straw for me was um, I read a story, a mum's story about the baby being born and then cutting the cord for, you know, complications and taking the baby away. And, like, that's just so detrimental to the baby's well-being and life and I was just like that's I'm safer at home like there's no way I'm giving birth at the hospital yeah. <laughs> and then I looked I tried to look for support 
So before that, I was looking for natural, like birthing groups, natural birth in hospital groups. And while I was looking for that, I found some unassisted groups and I saw women's stories or just like photos and they've just had a baby and they just like post their story up. And I was like, whoa, like that's it. Like they just pop a baby out at home. Like, <laughs> so and simple, I thought, right? Yeah. That was so unreal to me at the time. Like I just, and I even thought like, that's amazing, but I don't think I can do that. <laughs> but yeah, then I saw, and then I read that story. And then I also watched some birth stories online and there was a few that were a bit unsettling. And then I saw a woman standing up, birthing, catching a baby by herself. And I was like, if I have to do that to protect my baby, I will do that. Like, and so, plus you got to admit, there's a part of you that's like, that's badass. That is so <laughs> badass. Like I was so impressed. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that was like a game changer for me. So how pregnant are you at that point? I was, yeah, I was pretty, I was getting up there <laughs> by then, probably like a few, maybe like a month or two off and so I still continued going to my appointments and my very last appointment was supposed to be with a midwife on my due date and it was with a male obstetrician and he started talking about booking me in for an induction and all these crazy things and I was just like, no. Nah. That I like decided then like that's my last time there, I'm not going back. And so I didn't, but even when I was at home with my partner, like I felt like, I couldn't just say, you know, it's my first time making a baby. I'd never had a baby. So everyone around me was telling me like how they've had a baby and it has to be, you know, assisted at hospital. Like there's going to be these problems and blah, blah, blah. And like, I felt like it was like, who am I to say, no, like that's not going to be the case with me. Like, I don't know, like I've never had a baby. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I never voiced that, like I'm going to free birth. But in the back of my mind, I knew that I was going to stay at home. And knowing that the plan was just going to be you and your partner? Yeah, I had looked into what my other options were. There was no doulas in my area. Hmm. and Um, there was like, I found like a group, I don't know. I didn't really look too far into it. There was like a midwife in about three and a half hours away and I would have had to travel to all my appointments and I was too sick to do that. And then I would have, yeah, I would have had to rent around that whole time and then birth there. Oh, she wouldn't have come to your area. No. I just felt like that was too much for me. Someone I didn't even know. Right. For what? It it just didn't resonate. Like I was just like, like I never was like, oh, I'm going to free birth. But I was never like, I was just like, I don't need that. So, yeah, it got to, I was 40 weeks and two days. And I was living... So I was living on my mum's property, my partner and I. We have a self-contained unit that is still on my mum's property. So my mum was around and I tried to have little discussions with her about just the way I want my birth if I was to go to the hospital and my point was never getting across and I just Mm. felt like I couldn't tell her then untell her so to protect my baby and me and our space I just couldn't tell her that you know I wanted to stay at home so um did did anybody know besides your man no just my partner and I like I think I'd talked to one friend and I was like you know everyone was always like um when are you gonna pack your hospital bag and I was like yeah, when I feel like it's necessary. And I think yeah. I said to a friend, like, I, f- I just feel like I don't want to go there. Like, it's, I don't feel like I want to birth in that space. Like, I always feel anxious and sweaty and nervous there. Like, that's not a place 
to have a baby. Like nothing's wrong with me. Yeah. So yeah, it was 40 weeks and two days and um, my partner, Ando, he had said the whole time that that was the day that our daughter was going to arrive. And, <laughs> yeah, which is pretty cool. But I was in complete denial the whole, the whole time. Like I was like, I'm probably going to go like two weeks over and it's probably going to be like a really long birth. So I just wanted to be prepared for everything because I'd heard those stories and mm-hmm. how they go bad. Mm. So I just wanted to be prepared for all of that. So, yeah, I woke up at 2 a.m. that morning with like really sharp pains and I'd been having like tiny practice contractions. So I didn't really think anything of it. And then I woke back up at like about six o'clock and everything felt really tight and I felt like kind of sick. And by that time I hadn't been sick anymore. So it was. <laughs> you hadn't been sick for five minutes. <laughs> yeah, for like a couple of weeks. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> like, no, it's back. I know. But um, yeah, so Ando was like, today's the day. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Like, mm-hmm. like I'll see you soon. And he went to work. <laughs> ah, okay. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, I went and had a shower and yeah, I had like a loose bowel movement. Like everything was obviously happening, but I was like, no, I'm just like, my tummy's tight. But I sat in the shower for probably like two hours or something like, and then. Yeah, you're not in labor. (laughs) No, I was like. In the shower. Exactly. I was like, it could stop at any time and like start in another day. So, but yeah, then I came back to my room and um I threw up <laughs> oh. and everything was starting to happen so quickly yeah, yeah it did happen really quickly and so I was like I think I timed my contractions and they were like almost a minute long and two minutes apart and I was like is this like is this actual labor and I actually that's when I texted a friend who I know had like a fairly natural birth and I asked her like when did you know they were like proper contractions? So then I think I admitted to myself then like I'm in labor. <laughs> yeah, I'd say pooping, throwing up, yeah. <laughs> and strong back to back contractions is labor. Yeah, like what other signs can yeah. you get? <laughs> so yeah, I was like, I was vacuuming and just like walking around and trying to just, I just felt like walking around and like listening to music and stuff, but they started to get very intense. So I was, um, laboring and leaning over the end of my bed and my little chihuahua was there like trying to reassure me that I'm all right (laughs) yeah and um then I had to like lean on the fridge I needed to like bear down on something kind of so I was like okay it's time to call my partner and by that time it was 11 o'clock and I could like hardly talk like I didn't realize Wow. how far along I was. <laughs> Wait, you mean 11 in the morning? Yeah. Wow. And he had just left. Yeah. Like a couple only, hours. Yeah. Only at like six o'clock. So not wow. that long. Yeah. That's fast. <laughs> and I had, yeah. And cause I told him then like, no, it's not today. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and so he got home in half an hour and yeah, everything just started moving really quickly. Everything was like really intense, like big waves and I don't really, even straight after my birth, like I didn't remember very much. Like it all went really quickly. And um, I think, yeah, like I had my bloody show and we went to the shower and then I lost my mucus plug and then I just stayed in the shower. And my mum had come home at one point and she had come into the room and you know, I understand why she has fears around birth, but she brought those fears into my space. And so I just asked her, I just said, like, you know, we've got this, like, when my water breaks and I really feel like I need to go to hospital, we will, like. Oh, my God. And- <laughs> <laughs> so she comes yeah. in and you're still kind of playing the facade that you're going to go. Yeah. And then just kind of try to get her out. Yeah, because I... There was like at the time in that situation, there wasn't another, I didn't see another way. Like, 
so yeah that's just what I felt like that's what I had to do totally yeah yeah and so yeah I was in the shower and I think my mum and my sister came down again at one point but yeah it was kind of the same thing like I'm like oh it's cool like but by this time like (laughs) like, I was in labor blah <laughs> literally, like, you're like bearing down on the fridge. <laughs> literally, like they would leave, and then I'd get a contraction, and I was like, so I was in the shower at this point, and I was leaning over a big exercise ball, and I never thought I would make those like big animalistic sounds. Like I hear women say that all the time, but that's what I was like, like yeah, like big <laughs> loud like moans yeah. and. Um, yeah, because everything was so intense. So I was leaning over the ball and I had the water from the shower going on my back and it felt so good. And, but I felt like my contractions, between my contractions, I was resting for like five or 10 minutes, but Ando was like, no, they were like 30 seconds. Like, oh my gosh. yeah. So it was really intense for me, but I was kind of like, I don't know, like in and out of like consciousness kind of thing like but I needed that to get through it like I needed all those endorphins and everything to yeah get me through totally that was like such a yeah and you were able to just like get high and drop in and let it happen yeah yeah I don't know yeah that's totally what it was like um so yeah, I was going through contractions and everything was so intense. Like I couldn't even talk. Like yeah. I wouldn't have been able to advocate like what I needed from every anyone. Like my partner was so amazing. Like he was just there when I needed him. Like he didn't even need to speak. Like he was just there for me and he trusted me. And yeah, I'm so grateful for that. Mm-hmm. And huge. Um, yeah. So did at any point, did you... Like, was there any part of your brain that was even tempted to think about going to the hospital? No. (laughs) Um, I think when I started, I think at one point after my mom came in, um, Ando said to me, like, are you sure we shouldn't go to the hospital? Like, I think he was, you know, he felt responsible and he was kind of worried about, like, cutting the cord, which is now, like, not a big deal at all. Isn't that funny? Everyone thinks it's like literally the easiest part of a birth at home. Yeah. (laughs) But every so many people are like, but what about the cord? And I know (laughs) it really speaks to the ritual that somebody has to do it. Like this whole ritual that we see in movies of cutting the cord. And now we, you know, obviously know that it's like so simple. Totally. It's It's pretty funny now. So your mom comes back a second time and is like trying to convince you to go essentially yeah and I guess I just reassured her like oh the contractions aren't that bad I will go to the hospital when I feel I need to like when I'll tell you when my waters break (laughs) and then yeah Ando had my mum had left and Ando had said like oh are you sure we shouldn't go to the hospital and I was just like no like I could barely talk. I wasn't moving. Like, do you imagine getting in a car? It would be the worst. Like, it was just so hard. Like, I don't know how people do it, but yeah. So, um, we we're in the shower, and I think I started. Um, like, there was one second where I'm like, I'm shit at this. I'm so shit at this. I kept Aww. saying it over and over. And what's that called? Like transition. Uh huh. Because, like, straight after that, like, I don't know when it ended. I don't know how long it went for. But then it was just, like, I could feel the head. And I couldn't even speak to tell Ando. Like, everything just happened so fast. Wow, and, yeah. You know, like, the ring of fire and everything. Like, it was so intense. But I swear, like, the next contraction, her head came out and then she just followed out. And I remember, like, watching her, like, little body twist. And, like, she knew what to do. Like, she just came straight out and Ando caught her because I was, like, in this other world. Like, I was, yeah, so he caught her and we turned the shower off and we were just, like, in this little bubble. Like, I just remember being, like, oh, my God, like, crying and she's so perfect. And, 
I felt like I had pictured that exact birth the whole time. Like I pictured how perfect and healthy she would be and I pictured that birth the whole time. Mm. So, yeah, it was exactly how I imagined. Wow. But then, yeah, so we're in our little bubble. But then um, so my mum heard her cry for a little bit and then my mum came down on the phone. And so I kind of had... Wait, 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 what that... do you mean? She came down on the phone? Well, yeah, so she like... Well, I can't really like remember everything so clearly, but she heard Willow cry and I don't know if she came down and got her phone, but all I remember is seeing her with the phone on... She was on the phone to the ambulance. Oh, shit. Yeah, and so I thought that I would have you know, like, look what I've done. Like, I thought I'd be able to, you know, talk to her first. But I understand, like, she was a nurse before and she had seen traumatic things. So I understand, like, she was worried. But, yeah, um, the ambulance came, like, pretty quickly. And we didn't even, like, we quickly snapped some photos, but we didn't really even get, like, because it was just Ando and I, like, we didn't really even get, like, we got a couple of photos before they came. And then I just felt our space was violated. Yeah. And, like, they were all, like, younger and they were all excited because they hadn't even seen a birth before. Oh, my God. And so then they're, like, coming in, like, oh, we got to cut the cord now. And I was, like, no, that's not happening. So they had to, like, ring someone and ask permission. And I didn't want to go and I said, like, I don't want to go and I know that I like especially now I know that I had a choice but at the time I just felt so vulnerable yeah and so and I felt like you know I had my baby the cord wasn't cut so I felt like kind of in control so yeah I just didn't know how to get out of that so I ended up going with them Mm. so like they took me in the ambulance to the hospital did you get to stay with the baby yeah, so I didn't let them cut the cord and I just had her, like, I was like, I'm holding on to my baby. But your and placenta so, is still inside. Yeah. Damn, that is so fucking dangerous. It just, like, infuriates me that, yeah. that this is, not not you, obviously, not no, your story, yeah. but just yeah. how dangerous it is to disrupt that that moment, that, you know, that hour, that time frame before yeah. the placenta has released. Ugh. Yep. I'm so and, sorry. you know, my placenta took ages to of come out. Of course it did. <laughs> of course it did. It wouldn't have if you had stayed. Yeah. I know. Your whole body and, went. <gasps> and people say like, oh, you have to go to hospital. But it's like, I would have been so much better to continue staying at home. Mm. But yeah, everything went, it went as good as it could go. So we went there and they sat me on this potty thing in this big bright room I had like blood everywhere I was still holding my baby and I just put a (laughs) towel around me and all these midwives with really bad attitudes were like standing there like had their hands on their hips like staring at me oh my god and I had said that so my daughter was born at 1 30 so my labor I just say six hours but it was probably a bit longer but when I got to the hospital I said um you know, my labor was so quick. It was like two hours long. We didn't have time to go. Mm. And she just like came out. And even then they still treated me. They treated me like I did something wrong. They treated me basically like a criminal. And you did do something wrong in their mind. You know, like you're a bad, bad girl. Yeah. Yeah. Like I had the perfect outcome like I had a perfect birth a perfect baby and yeah but you having that actually makes them not needed you know so it's it's like symbolic I mean the it there's no celebration at the hospital for for you having the perfect normal birth at home you know that that erases you know and it and it reveals the lie that you should have been there, you know? So, yeah. And, and of course it's, 
of course you're not welcomed, you know, and this, yeah. I just, I could so see that image of the midwife standing around, you know, and you're like holding your sweet new baby and you're dissenting, you know, you're, you're dissenting and you're, you're not playing the good girl by not giving the baby over, by not letting them cut the cord, by not letting them pull the placenta out. I mean, all of this stuff is just like, for you to be a fiercely protective and intuitive woman and mother is wrong. It is bad. Yeah, they didn't like it. <laughs> of course <they> it's <laughs> it sucks, hey. And um so yeah, they were there telling me like your placenta needs to come out because like all of these things and then you'll need surgery. So right, right, eventually, right. <laughs> and then, like, cause I had a baby, but I can't get my placenta out by myself. <laughs> so, um, the cord, it had been ages by then, like a few hours. So the cord was white. Um, so my partner cut the cord and he was with the baby and I went to the shower to, so I could birth my placenta and literally every five minutes someone would come in and tell me that I needed like an intervention and I was just like just give me like five more minutes and they come back and eventually my partner just tell them to leave me alone like just give me some space and as soon as I happened my placenta came in like, <laughs> of course I just was like sitting on the toilet and it just yeah plopped out and so yeah. they didn't again they didn't give you pitocin or anything no they tried to do all of those things and I think with me each time rejecting like another intervention it would make them angrier like they were actually like mad at me wow yeah. and I'm wondering because you started off your story with saying how you're not you're not good with confrontation and yet you know, the, mo the mama bear in you is clearly willing to totally. deal with that. So when you were at the hospital and you're saying, no, 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 did you feel like just so terrible and like you were just this bad, terrible girl or, or did you know that it was, you know, your, your primal instincts were correct and fuck them? Yeah, basically. Like I think birth gave me that, like I birthed my baby and I knew that like I was the only one that could protect her. And so when like, you know, I was there and they were mad at me for like having like <laughs> a healthy baby, I was like, fuck them. Like yeah. I'm, I know what I'm doing. Like I'm, as soon as I get my placenta out, we're going home. Like, <laughs> and so, yeah, they wanted to check me and stuff like that. And I was just like, no, like we need to go home. Nice. And so um look at you not being confrontational that's like so hard <laughs> that's so hard I know. to say no to that stuff and you did it I know and I don't know how I would have like I feel like it's impossible to have like an undisturbed birth because the way I was like in my bubble like I felt like you know I was on like a new a different level like you know, like trying to like find my baby or something. Like I couldn't have people talking to me and asking me questions. Like there's the least relaxing place ever. Like it was horrible to me. And I think that proved that with birthing my placenta at the hospital, like it really reassured me, like us ending up there, it really reassured me that like I made the right decision staying at home and I'm never going back there <laughs> so um yeah so we were still there after I birthed my placenta and then um Ando went because we came in the ambulance so he went back home to put the car seat in the car oh right and bring it to the hospital and in that time um they wanted like an obstetrician to come check the baby but she just came in and lectured me about things that I you know rejected and yeah no one checked my baby the only thing they did to her was a nurse clamped her cord and like right near her belly button and they did it too tight and she ended up having like this little um hemorrhage type thing which yeah which eventually it just dried off and fell off but they were so rough with her like that's all they did and I even feel bad about that yeah <laughs> and so where we went straight home and we went and we went straight back into our like little love bubble like we're just so I was like so proud of what we 
did like us and like we just went to bed and stared at our baby like our yeah. perfect sleeping baby and we were like what do we do now like <laughs> totally is that it and my little dog like um my mum had when I was in labor at home my mum had taken her away and I didn't notice so when I got home like she thought she didn't know what had happened to me like she thought something really horrible had happened so came back with the baby and she was like, so excited to mm-hmm. see that I was okay and see a little baby and yeah we just stayed at home and yeah I feel like it was a like I wish that I hadn't ended up at the hospital at the end but it was also like that reassured me that we did the right thing yeah so Mm -hmm. I have to ask how angry at your mom were you yeah I I did feel betrayed and I do have like I still have anger in there from not like bringing it up because I still feel like it wouldn't be resolved wait so then you my mom you never talked about it no I like I know that I need to but I've tried to have little conversations and even like you know like next time like I'm having like an unassisted pregnancy and everything and then it's like no you're not blah blah blah. so Mm. yeah I just feel like at the moment like I can only deal with what I can control and I can't control her thoughts but yeah I do I did feel really betrayed and because I did think that I would be able to you know should be able to see that I could have a birth by myself I could have a healthy baby like my body is made for it and I would kind of see I did think that people would see it from that point of view like I thought my mum would you know understand and talk to me first yeah. You know, she's treating you like like a five year old, and that she was still in charge of you. It's yeah. super, super disrespectful. And, and and you know, if well, first I also wanted to ask: was do you still live on her land? Yeah, we do at the moment. Um, we're going to we're building a van at the moment. We're going to go travel around Australia, so we are going to yeah, move out of the space soon. But I think just because we invested in building a unit on her property, which was a really good thing for us because I was sick throughout my whole pregnancy. So I couldn't work. But yeah, it was a really hard situation to be in because, yeah, I had to make lots of choices, you know, to not tell her things. And yeah, it was really hard, like, yeah, to navigate that. Yeah. And it sounds like it kind of still is like, could you imagine, I mean, you and I both have young daughters and I just, I can't imagine like being that kind of mom. And I'm sure she's a wonderful mom, you know, I'm sure that there are a million wonderful things, but that piece that separates a mother from her daughter that overbearing, disrespectful, fear-based, fear-mongering, not listening energy, you know, and it's something that I hear all the time. I mean, just today, a woman in our membership um, was saying that she's free birthing and uh, her mother told her that if she does that, she's calling CPS and she will have social workers and social services at her door, which there's nothing illegal about making these choices. And so, it, yeah, you know, totally. whatever, but just, wow, like what to, to not lift our daughters up in, I in know. their choices. It's so sad it's really, that that yeah. thing is so broken, you know, because yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's it, everything. It, yeah. It is broken because like, I do imagine like if I did have my mom's support and she had all the right intentions, but fear overrode everything. Like she still believes that with me and my sister, like she had really long labors with interventions and which led to, um, so she still believes that we got stuck and C-section saved her baby and her life. That's the thing that's so interesting that we need to be so responsible with how we pass on stories to our children. Because, yeah. You know, 
that's just a story, right? And she's yeah. still to this day as as an elder, she's still trying to pass that story on to you guys and and have you guys essentially recreate the same story. And you know, yeah. I'm not targeting her. This is this is a symbol for tons of moms and dads. Yeah, that, totally. you know, I hear this story about. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's like you said, it's fear-based and it's really, it's really irresponsible because it doesn't let your kids create new stories and create better stories, which ultimately, isn't that what you want, you yeah, know, exactly. to have better stories and a better experience, whether it be with birth or marriage or whatever. I mean, I don't yeah. even know if I would say she had the best intentions. Like, I don't know, you know, it's pretty, yeah. it's pretty, um, that's a pretty darn big deal that you have your free birth and your mom just calls 911. And, and yeah. <laughs> we have other episodes of, of the same thing happening. Yeah. Uh, one of our good friends, her boyfriend, you know, she's pushing in her bathroom and her boyfriend calls 911 and they whisk her away, you know, and yeah. the baby was still inside her. It's just so crazy. It's so, so then, hard to hear. Like, So what are you going to do with your next whenever this, whenever your other kiddo <laughs> comes along, are you just going to like hide your pregnancy? <laughs> like, what are you going to do? I kind of feel like that. But then in another way, like I really want to like voice it from the start because, because I never um, said like during my pregnancy, I never said that I was going to have a free birth. And then even after my free birth, I kind of got treated like a child. I got treated like I did everything wrong. So even up until now, it's been really hard for me to say my story without feeling nervous or like having a lot of emotion. And I really want to like, you know, do my story justice. So mm. it's even now it's like still really hard to speak my truth about it. So I think I want to start from the start and be like, oh, cause I've already said to my mom, like, whether you like it or not, like I'm having an unassisted pregnancy and an unassisted birth, like, that's happening and if I'm not supported I'm going to fi- like go somewhere else <laughs> well you're you're not supported yeah you already know that so right? yeah you're, I'll go somewhere else <laughs> you're, you're, you already know that now now does that mean that you know she could never change of course not we hear about you know we hear about people shifting into support all the time it makes it makes me think of, you know, children coming out of the closet and saying that they're gay. You know, it's, it's so common, unfortunately, that Mm -hmm. parents, you know, don't know what to do with that and they're unsupportive. And then classically, I mean, I've seen this so often and heard so many friends stories of then the, the adult, the, or, or the, or the teenager, whatever the child, um, you know, cuts them out and they're like, cool. Like if you can't love me and see me and accept me, then peace. And so then yeah. the parents like, wait, 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 you know, and yeah. then figures out how to reacclimate. And, you know, I see it with free birth too, whether it's with the partner or with, um, or with a parent or, or with a sister, you know, this, this, and, and you're already onto it, that the first step is for you to really claim it. And, you know, and, and that's where I kind of want to just throw this out there for you that um, just as something to chew on, you know, that it doesn't, it doesn't need to actually start with your next pregnancy. It can start today. It can start tomorrow. You know, I'm wondering if you've ever told your mom that this was an intentional free birth. Um, I think she knows me. She knows how like strong willed I am. And so she does. But you've never like said, Hey, by the way. Yeah. I just haven't. I just kind of haven't bothered with the conversation because there's so much fear there that it always just ends up in me not getting anywhere and it ended up being in a fight. And I think, like you said before, I think, yeah, sometimes you just have to, you know, shut that down, especially like for your birth space. You can't have that in your birth space and just find support somewhere else. And that's why I think it's so important that you've made this platform for us to share our stories because the thing that changed everything for me was seeing um, mum birth her baby and, like, hearing those stories that, you know, we will do whatever it takes to protect our babies. And, yeah, it sucks that in this society that we can't even find support 
with our families. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just, yeah, women are so strong and powerful. They'll protect their babies and make it happen. And I mean, that kind of brings it full circle to your mom's experience, right? That she was just trying to protect her baby in her own, you know, in her own fear-based you know, delusion of how she was raised about birth and how she was, you know, told about her own births and that she's, you know, sadly living with a story that um, is almost for sure not true, you know, that, that her life was saved by surgery. And, you know, as we already know, that's extremely actually quite rare. Um, I can see the cracks in the story of where they intervened and, you know, why they needed eventually to have a Mm C-section because you hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, totally. Man, that is an interesting turn of events. <laughs> Damn. <gasps> oh. No, I actually, I do feel mad for my birth story that it went that way. Like mm-hmm. I do, I do like hear of like, oh, there was a podcast, Alex was on this podcast and she like, you know, she had her um, dog as a midwife. In <laughs> oh yeah. Her, People no, love that. In like a tent. In a year. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I'm like, I'm not, like that would be the ultimate. Like, but yeah, I had to go through a journey. Your chihuahua, of, your chihuahua is licking the blood, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> licking your nipples. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she was my little midwife. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I had to go through a whole different process of like my pregnancy leading up to get me to where, yeah, I ended up free birthing. Well, right. I mean, you didn't. You were not in a in a culture slash family where you felt safe and supported to fully claim your choices. And, you know, I love the fierceness in you that you did it anyway. And that's really, really hard. And it's kind of cracking me up that you started this episode saying that you're non-confrontational because (laughs) you you actually did something quite confrontational. Yeah. Because I had to. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was your truth and because it's, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful, self-protective way to you know have your baby absolutely I did like try to have those conversations where I would tell her why I didn't want to be at the hospital and like how like there was a different midwife any every time and no one would listen to me when I would say I wanted even a natural birth and so yeah I did try to tell her how unsupported I felt and so she in the end she did know that I birthed at home on purpose and she was actually mad at me like she kind of felt like I did that to her like I stressed her and so that's why it's been hard for me to bring up that conversation and you're right I do need to respectfully and put everything out there like I have said to her that next time I won't be going yeah like you said I should say I won't be going through the system you guys don't have to agree. She's not your partner, right? It's totally different if your partner and you are at odds, like that's really challenging. Um, you know, and thankfully it's not, you know, it's, it's complicated with this situation because you live on her land. So you're obviously quite inner interwoven, um, and, and a birth and a pregnancy are pretty much impossible to hide (laughs) if you're living on the (laughs) same property. Um, yeah you know, but you also can, I mean, I know women who have cut, not that I'm suggesting this, but I do know women who have said, um, you know, I love you mom and I'll call you when the baby's here because I'm not doing this. I'm not, I don't need to defend myself. I don't need to tell you a thousand reasons why I don't feel safe there. Like at the end of the day, you know, if, if you love me and trust me and respect me, like, then we don't actually need to talk about this. Yeah, that's kind of where I feel where my point's not getting across and that's kind of where I feel like I'm at. But, yeah, I will gauge it and it would, ideally it would be, you know, be nice to be able to put everything out there and be like, you know, I know you don't believe, you know, in what I'm saying, but this is what's happening. Like, yeah. It's not not believe. It's, (laughs) It's I know you don't support this. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not like a mythical creature. It's like you're making a choice, (laughs) you know, you're making a choice and then she's going, no, that's wrong. Well, that's fucked up. You're an adult. You're a mother. Yeah, exactly. And that's where the fierceness I think is really appropriate to be like, this is actually about respect. 
And if you can't see me as an adult woman, as a mother who's making um, the right decisions for her family, then I don't know how to be close to you. Yeah. And that's not your fault. Like your job is to have boundaries and boundaries are love. You know, they really are. And so, because yeah. otherwise you're going to stay in that weird dynamic of you still being the little girl, you know, forever, which obviously yeah. sucks. And how can you parent a child when you're treated like a child? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. Well, that's an awesome story. And I mean, even how you held it down at the hospital and just so much fierceness and I can just totally picture it. Very fast labor. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It was really- Everything was felt so intense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you kicked ass though. And so Thank I guess so the, the last question I have for you is how, particularly because you, you started our conversation, you know, speaking to you being non-confrontational and that you kind of kept this a secret and, you know, all of this stuff. So how having, after having a free birth and, um, and feeling the power and the fierceness, even in an unwanted transfer, how you protected your baby and yourself, how would you say that you have changed since this birth? As a yeah, woman? I think that changed everything for me. It set like a really good standard for how I was going to be as a mother. Like if you're being told that your body's failed you, and you can't trust your instincts and all of these things. And like, it would be really hard to trust like your parenting style when you have a newborn baby. Like it's really hard. Even like I felt really powerful after my birth. So I was like, I didn't have any assistance with breastfeeding. Like no one showed us how to, my mum showed us how to change a nappy. That was it. And, but because I felt, like I just knew what to do. Like I just felt like, yeah, I've got this. Like, so yeah, it's set like a really good scene, I guess, to just trust my instincts and parent the way I like I already knew how inside. It's interesting too because you also felt and you experienced the cost of not owning your decision to free birth. Because your mom not knowing even further created the reality that she would then call 911 thinking that that was always your plan. And so you, unfortunately, but you know, life is a series of this, you felt the cost of not being in um, your total truth with those around you. And yeah. so also what I'm hearing in your story is that you, you learned what, what can happen when you don't fully claim it and, and this excitement that you do have of, of really claiming it this time from out, out the gates. Yeah, I'm definitely going to push through the uncomfortable bits this time and just put it all out there and, yeah, take charge of my story. Yeah, I think that's important. I think that I definitely learned that that's something big that I learned mm-hmm. throughout the whole yeah, process last time. Because it is yours. It's yours. Yeah. It's nobody else's. It's not your mom's. It's not some random asshole on the internet. You know, it's your yeah. story and your baby's story and you're not public terrain, you know, so yeah. it's yours. And, and even if other people have opinions on it, it's so literally none of their business that, yeah. I mean, I, I, for better or worse, am getting a lot of experience at this. And yeah. <laughs> Okay. So hard. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it is hard, but, but I'm also really having to learn to another layer of it's nobody else's fucking business, how I live yeah. my life or how my friends live their lives or how women I don't even know live their lives. You know, it's, it, it's none of my business, how you live your life. And it's, you know, I mean, it's just when we trust women, it actually becomes really easy to get out of everybody's business. And so that's something I think a lot on is when people are really in other people's businesses, they don't trust those people. You know, yeah. they, they just don't, they, they think that they have to be some like savior or hero or um, whatever, you know, little judgy asshole or whatever it is, you know, it's all different ways to be in someone else's business. But when you mm-hmm. really trust women as kind of a blanket, you know, philosophy of life, it becomes really easy to just stay in your own business and stay out of everybody else's. 
Um, yeah. And I think to a degree, like I didn't trust myself through the whole process. Like how I said that I, you know, I'd never had a baby before. So I couldn't just say I'm going to have a free birth, but I actually could have done that. Mm-hmm. And like, that's what my last birth gave me is that trust in myself. Like, I know, like, I know what's best for me and I do know what's best for my baby. Totally. And that part of you that didn't trust yourself was not your authentic inner compass. The authentic inner compass in you is fierce as fuck and totally Mm. knows what you're doing. And, and you actually stood by it and, and were able to, um, you know, have this, you know, euphoric birth um, you know, it's, it's the, the part of you that like doubts yourself or that felt like you couldn't claim it. I mean, that's because literally your entire life, you've been told that you're just a stupid little girl that doesn't have a voice, you know, cause that's yeah. how we're all raised. I and feel like so, we are all raised like that. For sure. And so this is this like beautiful evolution. It's why I love doing this podcast so much is to hear these women's stories of, of just like shedding that and being like, well, this is my story of how I shed that and how I am claiming you know, myself as a powerful woman and as an intuitive mother. And that's exactly what your story represents. Thank you, Emily. It's so powerful. And thank you for having me here to share my story. Yeah, yeah. We're long overdue. It was perfect timing though. Yeah, like three years later. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I love it. No, it's so good. I love it. I love it so much. And I'm just so thrilled for you guys that you have a... Oh, thank you. And because when we booked the appointment like when we emailed and agreed on the appointment I wasn't pregnant then hey right. oh my god <laughs> like this is so new but yeah I it is the perfect time thank Aww. you yeah I think so too I can feel it awesome well thank you it was so nice to connect with you yeah thank you so much that's it for today everyone join us next week for another episode of the free birth podcast Thanks for joining us and remember your body, your choice. Lots of love.